Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicholas Norbrook. I'm the managing editor of the Africa Report. Just as an aside, uh, most of our best and uh, most reliable journalists are women, and I'm not just saying that. However, I'm very aware that I'm a, a man uh, moderating a panel devoted to affirmative action for women, so your irony klaxon may be going off. Uh, fortunately, we should avoid being posted on uh, the quite funny blog allmalepanels.com, which I recommend you, you have a look at at some point. Because our panel we have is, is diverse as well as being all-star. We have uh, uh, Geraldine Fraser Molichetti, the special envoy on gender for the AFTB. She'll be coming to, to give a briefing in a moment. We have uh, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala, the board chair for the Gavi Alliance and senior advisor to Lazard Frel. We have uh, Dr. Sahar Nazar, Minister of International Cooperation from the Arab Republic of Egypt. Uh, we have Marisa Lago, the U.S. Governor for the AF AFTB and Assistant Secretary for International Markets and Development from the U.S. Treasury. We have Dr. Jennifer Riria, for a board member of uh, KWFT and CEO of Kenya Women Holding. Admasu Tades, President and CEO of PTA Bank, and last but not least, Ashish Takar, founder of Mara Group and the Mara Foundation. So obviously, given such a collection of heavyweights, I will be wary of mansplaining. I don't know if you've heard this term. It's when a, a man patronizingly explains things to women. And I think we should add uh, uh, another word to the lexicon, uh, Westsplaining, the idea that West knows best and that the West should explain to you what to do. That is, of course... Nonsense. The playing field is far from level in the country where I work, France, for example, where there is a 44% gap between the salaries of working class men and working class women, obviously in favor of the men. Um, according to U.S. Census Bureau research in 2010, women in America continue to earn just 77 cents for every male dollar and, for goodness sakes, the women in the Swiss canton of Appenzell Innerhoden only got the right to vote in November 1990. That's the year the internet was invented. Which, which goes to show it's always a, a tough slog to push these issues, especially financial inclusion. And there are clear barriers. Women in Africa face a financing gap of up to $30 billion uh, when you include the informal sector in that. And there's a lot of resistance against this idea of affirmative action, despite the fact that it clearly works in some domains. In a little bit, I will be asking you to take a vote by a show of hands on this subject, asking whether you think affirmative action can actually work in the field of finance. It worked in education in the US. It was perhaps less successful, certainly initially, in South Africa's Black Economic Empowerment, or BEE. So get your thinking caps on. Uh, can affirmative action work in finance? In any case, hats off to the AFTB for tackling this issue head on, because we don't have much time left uh, in Africa before our demographic dividend becomes a time bomb. We need to create jobs quickly. And uh, this august panel will explain it far better than I will, but women-run and women-owned businesses will create sustainable development, will create jobs, will create the solid foundation of underlying wealth on which the continent's industrialization will be built. Now, in a moment, Geraldine will, will lay out the concept and mechanics of AFAWA, affirmative, action, uh, affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa, this new program of the AFTB, uh, which uh, the AFTB will be launching with partners, uh, a program that has been several years in discussion, which is coming now to fruition. And what this session is designed to do is to proof it, test it, refine it, like in pottery or, or ceramics, when the raw clay has, has been given its form and then placed in a kiln and the temperature whacked up to 1,000 degrees and the impurities burnt away and you're left with something solid, something hard, a vessel that can really hold water. And uh, uh, just between uh, you and me, dear audience, I have women on this panel who can really bring the heat. I think it's the men who will be doing the, uh, the catching up. So, to give you a brief outline of what to expect over the next couple of hours, we'll have a presentation on AFAWA, we'll have a panel discussion, we'll then turn to the eminent discussants, and then we'll ask you, the audience, who are also a part of this firing of the kiln. Um, so, without further ado, let me ask Geraldine to come to the podium to brief us on AFAWA. Please greet her with applause. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning to everyone. Um, 
I hope that the presentation will go up in a minute, but I'd want to welcome you all here, and in particular to the panel. You know, we've had a number of midwives uh, and midmen, I don't know what you call the males who help with the birthing, uh, gynecologists probably, or something like that. But this has been in a process of gestation. We saw the need not as the African Development Bank only, but I think as uh, women and men of Africa and globally that we should look at how we can take this agenda forward. And many of you would recall that the president of uh, the African Development Bank at uh, the Feed Africa Summit made the announcement uh, on the formation of what we have called AFAWA, this affirmative, uh, um, ac uh, the affirmative financing action for women in Africa. And the background is clear. You can link it to the SDGs, Agenda 2063, and so it goes on. But for us, it's to look at African women in the economic value chain. As you all are aware, African uh, women make up more, the, more than about half of the country's populations. The majority of these women live in rural areas and are primarily dependent on agriculture for their livelihoods. Women constitute the majority of the agricultural labor force, and this ranges from 50% in certain instances to 70% across different regions and producing 80% of food in countries. We want to recommend that there's a need to increase the number of women entrepreneurs in large-scale agribusinesses by providing training and access to financing and by improving market links. In cocoa, cassava, and coffee, we have identified opportunities to create large women-owned agribusinesses in higher value add activities. There's also a need to increase incomes by improving productivity and training women in core business skills. As we were reminded in a panel um, uh, two days ago, there's also a need to take into account that the uh, value chain doesn't start um, on the land, it starts with research. And we'd like to ensure as we take this forward that we take this into account. Now, there is a market and financial gap. And women have been noted to suffer considerable limitations to access finance. And the problem is more pressing in sub-Saharan Africa, um, uh, more than in other re developing regions. An analysis of the World Bank survey, Enterprise Survey of 2013, shows that female participation in business ownership averages over 25% across the region, although there are considerable variations across countries, with Niger reporting as low, uh, a very low 10% uh, of women's participation in business activity, and Ghana just under 10%, 50%. The gender challenges that are faced by women in their efforts to establish new businesses. And I heard this when I was with, uh, uh, in uh, um, Kenya, it also came out very strongly. This is explained by observed low capitalization level of women-owned businesses, especially when compared to men, irrespective of whether the businesses are new or existing. <laughs> And in 2010, there was a study report that found that the medium capital available to male entrepreneurs is more than twice that of female entrepreneurs. And I'll give examples of four. I'll just mention four African countries, Côte d'Ivoire, Kenya, Nigeria, and Senegal. And these limitations to access to finance extend beyond the MSMEs and SMEs in urban societies with rural societies, especially rural women farmers, also constrained. And this is despite the fact that strong evidence suggests that interventions enhancing 
rural women's productive capacity by improving their direct access to resources such as land, water, education, fertilizer, paid work, and technical assistance lead to more efficient allocation of family um, resources. And so the story can go on. Now, the financing gap for women in business is established at 42 billion US dollars. And the ADB, um, the AFDB, the African Development Bank's market scoping exercise of 20, May 2016 that informed the design of AFAWA, in particular to assess the finance uh, landscape for women in business in um, 54 South, uh, African economies that was supported by a deep dive. Country assessment was conducted in Cameroon, Mali, Kenya, Morocco, Nigeria, and Zambia. And the findings reveal, unsurprisingly, that the landscape for women's access uh, to finance in Africa remains limited. I'm not going to uh, go into the details thereof, you have uh, the graph on the screen. Safe to say that uh, the recommend recommendations from our study says, for our FAWA to be successful, we need to take a country by country approach and lever leverage uh, existing successful practices in promoting access to finance. Our FAWA will not be successful in isolation given the magnitude of the issue. It should probably think of itself as a catalyst for market forces to take over once there's solid proof of concept. There's a need for a clear implementation plan and growth strategy as integral parts of the program's long-term financial sustainability framework, and it's essential for communicating a long-term partnership vision to participating financial institutions. Now, you know, a flagship program is not long, not long lasting. And uh, this is what we look at. So we want to deal with this quickly. The major barriers to access to finance, you know it all, that women business are considered too risky by commercial banks. Ashish, take that into account. And we'd like to see a change coming from that side. We know there's high loan interest rates when uh, women are considered to have a lack of a business track record and sector of activity. And this is because you find them in essentially in the informal sector. Discrimination for being women, we saw that especially in North Africa. And so it goes on, inappropriate legal and regulatory frameworks. And again, the panelists will be able to speak more to this, and I won't... Uh, go into example. So what is our objective? To unleash women's economic potential and to enable women's businesses to access finance through financial intermediaries. And we want it to be available, accessible, and affordable. So we want AAA ratings to mean something else as well. We believe that there is a strong business case for AFAWA and in the consideration of the nature of challenges that women entrepreneurs face, and based on our analysis, we see the case for supporting women entrepreneurs through well-structured financial instruments complemented by targeted capacity building initiatives. We will be launching this uh, program to effectively address the financing needs of African women-owned or African women-managed businesses, especially those businesses whose owners or managers constitute the so-called bottom of the pyramid. So the program will have a financing window that will make use of various bank financing instruments depending on the needs of the women entrepreneurs through financial intermediaries. It will have a technical assistance component, and this is something that's uh, come through very strongly, and it will also extend this to second-tier intermediaries, the MFI, SACOs, et cetera, 
to assist them in building capacity to strengthen their services and better serve the women's target market. It will work to support uh, uh, regional member countries, and there will also be an online marketplace, a digital marketplace. So we'd want to make a sales pitch and state that we're putting skin in the game. And the ADB uh, will contribute up to $150 million of investment financing over the next two years from the non-concessional um, lending window. The financing window will be complemented by co-investors. The AFAWA management unit will be put in place with the first gender financing unit at the bank. It's a flexible program that will allow a dedicated assessment process of project proposals from financial institutions starting from tomorrow onwards. It's, uh, it will um, also allow um, a, a, a leverage of our various instruments, SME uh, finance, trade finance, risk sharing facility from the public sector facility, private sector development, skills and technology development and more. We're looking at tailored technical assistance to women in business to build their capacities, to financial institutions to better assess the needs of women entrepreneurs and to deliver targeted, available, affordable, accessible products and to showcase successful African women in business and will ensure dissemination of knowledge. It's not the African Development Bank alone. It will involve some on the panel, some in the line at, uh, in the front row, and there are those who are not present here because we've had discussions with other partners on the continent and globally that includes IFC and others. So this was this introduction. I'm sorry, moderator, I overstayed my, uh, uh, my tenure year, but I thought it was necessary to do this introduction and to trigger our panel to be audacious about the implementation and the rollout. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Round, round of applause. Thank you very much. Don't forget, hashtag Afawa for those of you who are uh, keen Twitterati. Um, I want to quickly turn to the audience. We're going to do a straw poll just in this room here by a show of hands. Do you think affirmative action can work in finance? Those who think it's an unambiguous yes, raise your hands. I think we have our answer. Those of you who are not sure that, oh, you know, maybe it doesn't work in finance, please raise your hands. We don't have that many people to convince, is the good news. <laughs> um, Dr. Konje Wiala, let me start with you um, and ask what really has worked in your various positions of authority, be it finance minister in Nigeria or MD of the World Bank, what really has worked in terms of policies and funding mechanisms when it comes to uh, getting women to participate in the economy? Hello. Well, thank you very much, and thanks to Geraldine for that presentation. Before I get into what has worked, it's just to, we've had a lot of numbers and statistics here, but just to remind ourselves that Africa has one of the highest female labor participation rates globally. According to the ILO, it's about 63.3% compared to 50.3% globally. So women are very, very active in the African economy. We know it, but I, I, I mean to, it's good to remind ourselves as to why it is we need this action. If you have women very active, but they don't have access to the instruments that can make them productive for the continent, then you're missing something. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make is that the value added of women is totally not captured. It's undervalued mainly because they're in the rural areas, in informal activity and so on, the activities or in the home, you know, their contribution to the economy is undervalued, not measured. 
And we have to find a way to correct that because that leads to this systematic bias where they're not giving output. Rational beings, when they see that, look, I'm going to make profit by investing in these people because their value added is captured, will do that. Now, we were very excited in Copenhagen a few days ago when Melinda Gates announced $80 million uh, at the Women Deliver Conference for investing in measuring value added of women in collecting data. She's, they are going to invest $80 million. Everybody was universally excited because this is what we need uh, to do that. And we need to actually focus. Geraldine, I wanted to say one of the things that this initiative also needs to do is to add a data component and partner with the Bill and Melinda Gates. Try and capture some of that $80 million for us on the continent so that we can get our value added. Now, what has worked? We, there are so many studies now, you know, that show, apart from the statistics here, even though we don't have all the value measured, but the World Bank studies, the Gender World Development Report of 2012, the McKinsey study that shows that if women were to participate in the economy at the same rate as, as men, by 2025, we'd be adding $28 trillion to the world economy. That's the U.S. and Chinese economies combined. If, if countries perform just as well as their the best neighbor, we would add with men and women working at the same rate, $12 trillion. So the numbers are enormous. Um, recognizing these things, in Nigeria, we try to do a few things to value uh, the, the importance of women in the economy. We know it, you know, in Nigeria, women are very, very active, and I think it's generally known. So what did we do? Um, first, we launched a program in, in, uh, just for young entrepreneurs in the economy called You Win. We did the first round. The whole idea was to have a business planning competition whereby entrepreneurs could be assisted to create jobs. Instead of waiting around for jobs, why not create a job for yourself and for other young people? So that's what we aimed at. When we did the first round, there was a lot of skepticism. We were going to... Uh, we, we announced we would be giving grants of uh, 10000 up to $90,000 for winners in the business planning competition. 24,000 people applied in the first round. It was all very done on the internet, on merit, etc. And we noticed that only 17% of applicants were women. When we know that Nigeria has one of the fastest growing pools of female entrepreneurs in the world, even according to the World Bank study, Nigeria and Ghana, female entrepreneurs are stripping men. So we decided to target women, especially with a round. And we did that because we didn't understand why only 17%. We decided to do the affirmative action we are talking about, that there may be barriers we didn't know about preventing them from applying. When we opened it up to women 45 years and below and to 18 years, we got 64,000 applications. The 64,000, we weeded them down to 6,000 with the help of the World Bank, the DFID, um, <coughs> Lagos Business uh, uh, School, Pan-African University Business School. And we had a very transparent process in which 1,200 winners Emerge. We trained the 6,000 in writing a business plan, and we chose the best 1,200. These people got grants from 10,000 to 90,000. And the results were amazing. The, with $8 million investment, the women created more than 10,000 direct jobs, and I think twice as many indirect jobs. So we showed that if you give women access, we not only gave the grants, we also had mentorship from existing business owners. We, we had peer-to-peer -peer learning. We gave access to uh, introduce them to banks and release their money through the banking system so they would have accounts. We got businesses registered by having a one-day registration program in the Ministry of Finance. They all came. And, you know, it was also very good, as I always joke, by registering all those businesses, we were also registering future taxpayers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that was an ulterior motive that I had, because our tax base is too narrow, and we need to get all these informal businesses formalized. So those were uh, amazing achievements to me, the number of jobs created. The last 
um, point I want to make on what worked was again using the budget as an instrument in a different way to say to ministries, if you volunteer to achieve additional results for women over and above what you would have done, you will get extra budget. And that worked as well. We had five ministries volunteering, incl including the Ministry of Agriculture, which was run by the president of the African Development Bank. And he wanted to get more women using the electronic wallet so they could get easier access to inputs. And it worked. He was able to get 2.5 billion more women on the roll. Uh, we had the Ministry of Water Resources that was able to get women into water enterprises for their communities, managing water and sanitation facilities. The Ministry of Public Works, training women as subcontractors. They volunteered, which was very good. So I think these two examples of you know, using the budget as an instrument can be very powerful. As a result, actually, the community of practice of finance ministers that Gen Geraldine referred to was started both at the ADB and the World Bank, and I think it will, it will yield results. So but the final point I want to make to Geraldine is, this AFAWA is a very good initiative, but I think we need to learn lessons from some of the, the previous um, efforts to get finance to women through intermediaries. What has been the result? Some of them have worked fairly well, many have not. And I hope we'll come back to it so we'll discuss what are the barriers we need to remove that are, will block women from getting access to this finance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, Ashish, uh, I understand you have some time constraints. So with the, you know, with the willingness of the panel, I'll, I'll turn to you next. Um, you've been recognized for your leadership in enabling, empowering, and inspiring uh, young entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs. Can the private sector do better to support women entrepreneurship. What needs to be put in place for you? Thank you so much, and thank you, um, Geraldine, Auntie Ngozi. Um, I'm, I would like to apologize. I unfortunately uh, do have to run. Uh, there, I've learned that there's no such thing as a free meal, and therefore I'm, I'm having to work for it at the bank here. But uh, So I apologize for that in advance. I think this is a really, really uh, important and an absolutely crucial conversation. and. I don't want to over-dramatize it, but our future does depend on it, and I think it's really important. The economic empowerment uh, of women is essential for gender equality, but has a direct effect on reducing inequalities in general, which is in line with the SDGs and something that needs to be done. As you know, I, I really see um, the ecosystem approach of the so solution. Um, as a young entrepreneur who started my business at the age of 15 with no capital, no ability to network, there's a huge bias against young entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs specifically. And when you think about the ecosystem overall and more broadly, you know, mentorship is absolutely crucial. Now, I'm not saying this because I'm uneducated and I'm the worst advocate for education, but on a practical note, I think informal education in form of mentorship is absolutely important. It's not... Uh, taught uh, in the education systems. It's not available for women to just access and therefore mentorship programs are really, really important. Um, Mara Mentor, which is our mentorship program of our foundation, uh, we launched it in Nigeria, uh, in South Africa, Ghana, and, and, and yesterday in Zambia. We've got over 850,000 entrepreneurs across the continent benefiting from this. Over 50% of them are women beneficiaries. So it, it, it's a really, really important angle that does need to be tapped into. The second piece which really feeds into Afawa and was touched on is the whole access to finance. And when you think about the banking model in general, um, traditional banking on the continent has been such that it's been taking customers' deposits, putting it into government treasury, making 1,000 to 1,200 basis point spreads and not lending to businesses. Particularly, and who really suffers in this are the SMEs, which are really young entrepreneurs and women entrepreneurs. So I think we need to have a fundamental shift of how financial services is conducted. And that's what we're trying to do as Atlas Mara, uh, which is our bank. And it's really trying to be a bank for business, which is the whole element of innovation, but also serving the underserved markets. And that is young entrepreneurs, that is women entrepreneurs, that is creating technology, which helps that. 
data is absolutely crucial. Today, why do banks not lend to young, young businesses particularly is because of lack of data. And that's where the whole ecosystem approach of mentorship and other initiatives really do come about. Uh, at Masu of the PTA Bank and I were having a great conversation and looking at many initiatives. I think what the Africa Development Bank is doing is crucial. But collaboration in this space, the, the numbers that are stated that are, that are lacking are going to grow even higher because our entrepreneurial spirit on the continent is so high and the energy is so great that we do need to feed this and we need to create self-sustainable ways to do it. The last part of the ecosystem, in my opinion, is public policy. Aunt Ngozi did an amazing job when uh, she was the Minister of Finance, but creating the right policies and the right enabling environment for businesses to thrive and really attracting, I mean, there's a direct benefit, as you touched on, which is getting businesses from the informal sector to the formal sector. And that is only going to happen if we create the right kind of framework uh, for businesses to really survive in. So that's how I would look at the, the ecosystem. And, and, and do you think women entrepreneurs uh, need to be treated differently from their male counterparts? It's, um, it's, it's a really, really good question. I mean, and a lot of people do ask me this. I think, fr frankly, I think women are extremely competent. They're more reliable than men in terms of as entrepreneurs. And I have never heard women say that they want any special treatment, neither do I think they need any special treatment. What I think women need and deserve is equal treatment. And I think there is absolutely no excuse for not implementing that. I mean, in our organization, we have so many senior executives who are women. Now, obviously, if I had a competent man and a competent woman, I'm going to hire the woman for sure. But, so there is a bit, of, a bit of bias towards that. But there are phenomenal people out there. I think what we need to do is create a level playing field. The 70 cents, 77 cents to a dollar. These kind of things need to change immediately. And I think it's the public sector's responsibility, but equally, it is the private sector's responsibility to step up as well. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Minister, let's come to you. You, you have experience, uh, obviously, from both the private sector and the public sector. You've worked on developing the uh, SME sector. Um, how important is it to get the environment surrounding women-run businesses right? Capital, but not just capital. What, what are the other barriers that women might face? Yeah. Thank you very much. First, I want to start by I'm very happy to see this panel with gender mainstreaming, but I'm hoping that other panels that discuss jobs, climate change, and uh, African leaders has more women sitting on, on the panel. So <laughs> thanks for that. Not just the gender sessions. That's an important point I want to start with. And I count on the African Development Bank to make sure that gender mainstreaming really happens across the board because it's a cross-cutting issue. It's not just a women's issue. It's, it's a developmental issue that touches upon the whole society. Um, on, on the um, what should we do, uh, that, it's very true. It's something that I've, I've done a lot of research on and I've worked both in international financial institutions and now as a minister. And I, I want to first highlight what are the roots and the causes of the challenge because women do have less access to finance and they don't have equal opportunities as entrepreneurs. A lot is based on wrong perceptions and myths. So um, as Ashish said, there is a perception that they are high risk and Gerard also highlighted that, they're high risk when data shows exactly the opposite. In fact, the default rate, non-performing loans for women are in fact lower because they're always under pressure to go an extra mile, to be more cautious, uh, very concerned about their family stability, that's the, and they always feel they need to extra mile to prove that they are not defaulters. So the evidence, the numbers, not just in Africa, but across the globe, proves that. Second thing, there is always um, also a perception that women have to balance between her job and family, and hence is less committed, when, when obviously that's not true. First. Family responsibility goes for both partners, but also that women have been able to balance their, their family responsibilities and work, and that, that's the myth that also we need to look into. The legal and regulatory framework, which I want to add to the list of, of what we have on the affirmative action, which I feel is missing, is very critical when we're talking about developing countries, because 
Um, women often don't have their legal rights put in place. There is uh, the traditions that prevent women from having real access over their assets. So they're in the rural areas, so, it's, so the sister uh, or the wife would inherit part of the land parcel but would not have full authority over that to use as a collateral or even to, to use as a productive asset. And I think that's something, there, there is always a perception she needs a male guardian, whether it's the father, the brother, or even the son in some cases. So I think that's something the legal rights needs to come because it affects access to finance. Because in many cases, if you're talking about the formal financial sector, you need, you need collateral. That's very true. But what do we do from there? What if you're talking about startups and young entrepreneurs where, they, where there is no collaterals at all? And, and this is where you, you need the legal and regulatory framework that, that is conducive for that. So in Egypt, we've uh, issued and ratified the, just recently the microfinance law because, because the, the women are represented largely in the informal sector and rural areas and there is a need for microfinance, and that's mainly through NGOs and MFIs, because civil society plays a pivotal role when we're talking about poor villages. And that's, at the end of the day, we're talking about better access because we, we're after improving the standard of living of the whole family, where women plays a pivotal role. So, so poor villages, you do not necessarily have banks or formal financial institutions existing. So, so civil society here is, is critical. Uh, microfinance institutions, so m some countries need that law to be implemented to allow NGOs to have access to finance, whether through IFIs or, or bilaterally. Then the non-bank financial institution, which addresses also the lack of collaterals and lack of uh, financial statements as uh, Ngozi, my former boss <laughs> at the World Bank, has highlighted, because in many cases, the informal sector, they don't have the the, the financing to hire the best auditor or the legal advisor to help them put the, uh, the right and prudent financial statements. So, so if you're reaching out to financial leasing as um, part of the non-bank financial institution, you don't need any collaterals. And, and hence, the, the asset that you're leasing becomes your collateral. So I think that's another area that, that I think the initiative needs to, to highlight. Post offices in poor villages are another tool that, that we should not neglect and would address physical access, lack of physical access. Um, skills, of course, skills, the, there is a need for to develop skills. That's also, I don't wanna be uh, women specific there, but I, th I think skills are needed for both wo women and men, especially when you're talking about smaller, smaller and micro enterprises. Lines of credit are important, and maybe here, I, because I'm, I'm financial sector background, so I don't wanna call it affirmative, but I wanna use a more, uh, a different word, which is diversification, because if you're addressing risks mitigation, you, you need to diversify. So we tend to talk about diversification by sectors, agriculture versus industry versus tourism, but let's also do diversification by gender then it doesn't become affirmative because you don't want to go into distortion by economists. They'll tell you you're distorting the market. And it's very true, as, as she said, you just need equal opportunity and equal access, not really special access, but just equal access so that they are treated equally and that the projects are bankable. So I think that's important to do, highlight. Do you think there'll be sort of a pushback against this idea of affirmative action in Egypt, for example? Is it important perhaps for Afawa not to, you know, not to insist on the affirmative action, but perhaps choose another way of presenting, as you suggest, as a diversification? I think in Egypt you have the National Council for Women that is really promoting gender mainstreaming and economic, social, and political empowerment of women, which matters, uh, looking at the parliament that will, will ratify all the laws and regulation. But on finance, I would be careful on using the word affirmative because it's easier to use diversification and it, you will achieve the same objective. But I think this is where international organizations and bilaterals can come in, where when they provide lines of credit, they make sure that a certain percentage, minimum 40%, even if not 50%, is allocated to women, but not all, only women, but also youth. So I want to also highlight women and young people too, that are often marginalized in many of our countries. So I think 
being diversified is a better word, it achieves the same objective, but affirmative on many of the other things like legal rights, uh, uh, equal access to, uh, to a, a, re a conducive legal regulatory environment is uh, still good, but I would, on finance, I would use a less distortive term and, and do diversification. That's where I go. But on Egypt, where I'm, I'm a women minister, we have a parliament where 15% are women, which is historical. It, the last percentage was 1.7 in, in before the revolution. So I think that's, that in itself tells you we're not there yet, but I think we're on the right track. Thank Fantastic. you. Thank you. Marissa, in your role, you, uh, you lead the portfolio of the U.S. Treasury on international financial services regulation, trade, banking and securities, development, technical assistance, and climate finance. Do you have a fantastically large staff to, to help you with all this? Uh, hope I you do. have a fantastically expert dedicated staff, <laughs> not large enough. <laughs> um, so uh, can you tell us what you see as the opportunities for foreign investment in the African financial sector targeting women and, um, and what long-term economic benefits do you see of, of such investments for the private sector? Well, like the minister, I also want to start out with an observation. It's a delight to be on a panel with so many people that I've learned from I love the diversity of this panel, but I would look forward to an African Development Bank at which the opening session features not just the minister, but many, many more women as heads of state on the stage. <laughs> so when we think about the kinds of financial and non-financial services that female entrepreneurs need, I think it's important actually to take a step back and look at how women, and most especially poor women, use money so we can make sure that the services that were provided work for them. And it's not just enough to make money work for women. We have to make the entire financial services system work for them. And that means we need to increase access to financial services. But again, that alone isn't enough. If you have access, but women aren't actually using the services. We've gone a step of the way there, but we haven't begun to solve the problem. And so it's important that the financial services that we provide promote trust and that they deliver sound products and products that end up with good results for the woman. Now, as a policymaker at Treasury, I've seen that often it's the legal and regulatory barriers that exclude women from the financial system. The minister made reference to it. Now, these can range from very explicit discriminatory law laws that don't give women a legal identity. Related to that are laws that deprive women of having access, explicit access, to collateral or account ownership. I'm quite bullish on the opportunity that technology may play. Sorry about that. Hopefully I was using my big Brooklyn voice so you heard some of it. Um, I'm hopeful that technology may be able to play a role here. If we think about legal identity, we see the program that India has rolled out to give identities to millions, tens of millions of people across the subcontinent. Similarly, with respect to access to collateral, one can hope that women's use of mobile technology might be able to be tracked and so that there could be a record of repayment even if women, because of legal barriers, don't have formal title to their cows or other forms of collateral. Now, another area where I think that there are legal and regulatory barriers that could be overcome is in the area of insufficient data. I was so heartened, Ngozi, on your mention of the Gates Initiative because as finance ministers, as business people, we know that you manage what you measure. You need the data to measure. And I would put in a big plug to the Gates Foundation that a portion of this data initiative should be focused on sex disaggregated data, which will help us target the products to women and women entrepreneurs. Now, I'm from a finance ministry. I think Ngozi 
can relate. We like our statistics. And so I thought to give a few more statistics. I'll start with the encouraging one. From 2011 to 2014, 700 million adults became first-time account holders. Also, mobile money account ownership is driving a huge expansion of financial inclusion, and this is particularly true in Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa is the only region in the world that has countries where more than 10% of adults have a mobile money account. Interestingly, back at Treasury, we have a very major financial inclusion effort underway, focusing both domestically and internationally, and given that I live on the international side of the house, I'm so proud that it is the learnings that we are bringing from around the world that are very much affecting our domestic initiatives. Now, unfortunately, I still have some pretty depressing statistics. Today, 58% of women worldwide owned an account in 2014 that was compared with 65% of men. It's an 11% increase for women and for men since 2011, but what's so depressing is that there is this stubborn 7% gap that did not narrow at all during that period of time. And if we look at developing countries, the gap in account ownership between women and men is at 9%. So these dreary statistics explains why we're so bullish on AFAWA's potential to address this stubborn gap, especially given that AFAWA has this holistic approach. Wisely, AFAWA recognizes that financial resources are necessary, but they are not nearly sufficient to close the financing gap for female entrepreneurs. The investments have to be targeted uh, or have to be accompanied by targeted policy reforms and so I think it is important for all to keep pressures on our governments to make these policy reforms, some of which were just mentioned by the minister. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to ask you one extra question, really, to, to give us your perspective on uh, affirmative action in the United States, because it, it seems to me that you know any affirmative action program is always going to create a class of, of you know, of sour grapes or, or bad losers or, or however you want to cast them. Um, but nevertheless, they have a, uh, the ability to block things. Uh, how, how, what are the learnings you can, you can share with us from, uh, from the U.S.'s history with affirmative action? What are the pitfalls that Afawa should try to avoid? I guess I have the disadvantage of being trained as a lawyer. <laughs> and so... Um, in the United States, affirmative action has been a driving force to address to, to um, address historical inequalities, historical problems. I would think as Afawa goes forward, though, we can very easily talk about it, as the minister suggested, in terms of diversification and also in terms of opportunity. And finally, in terms of just sound, good business sense. If we look at the underrepresentation of women in the economy, I don't see absent a discriminatory intent, an uninformed intent, an absence of education that people would consciously say, yes, our society benefits from keeping people on the sideline. And so I don't think we need to use a rubric of affirmative action. We can get to the same place through enlightened self-interest. Great, thank you. Now, Dr. Ruria, you have a, a very interesting and particular story to tell. You're an established and successful entrepreneur, a self-taught professional leading a financial institution. You integrated the social outcomes into the business model, the, the double bottom line. Um, how important is it for you uh, that a financial institution has a specific focus on women in business. And obviously we've had history, we've had theory. Give us some of the, the practice now. Thank you very much. Uh, after all the speeches by these clever people, I don't know what to tell you other than tell you the truth. 
I come from 26 years of working with Kenya women, with low-income women, working with three million women over time. I come from Women's World Banking, where I chair an organization that reaches over 25 million through affiliates and associates. From UN Conference 19, 19, 1975, to Beijing 1995, to today, we have meetings like this. And we continue talking and talking and talking. Let me tell you what we are doing in Africa. We are like getting to a field of football and half of the team gets to the field and is playing Manu, but the half of the team is not playing. This is what we have done over the years. Can we get off the speaking panels and getting to really saying this, committing to this? Tomorrow, we will fund so many women. Let's have clear KPIs that each country, that each bank, that each civil society seated here will commit to. Let's not talk anymore. We, are, you know, we have grown old, became grandmothers on the talking table. <laughs> As we continue talking, 1.1 billion women today do not have access to a cent to bring food on the table for their families. So are we proud that we are sitting here and talking? Really? I think that when I walked into Kenya Women, and this is the story, in 1991, I walked into a, in, into a bank, one of the biggest banks in Kenya, and we are very well banked. And the, I said to the bank manager, please give me two, it was $500, no, $5,000 to own land at a level of $50 to the women to go to the market, buy vegetables, and come and sell them and feed their families. The bank manager looked at me and said to me, Jennifer, do you really want to tell me you want your women with their baskets on their backs to crown my counters? I never answered him, and I cried. It's funny today to me, but that day I cried and got out of that bank. By the end of the day, I got somebody to give me $2,000. The story is this. Women are not one. When we sit here and say, we are and Fawe is a beautiful thing, you know, I'll come back to that. But when we sit here and talk about women, we need to realize women are not one type. From where I come from, from Kenya women, we have women at different levels. They require interventions at different levels. You will not give those interventions unless you begin looking at women's needs from a woman's lens. Don't say, we'll do it for the women. Say, we'll do it with the women. Then you are making sense. Yeah. We learned also that it is not about money. Women are not where they are because of money. They are where they are because there are systems in place that make sure they don't. We will come here to African Development Bank and we'll have three million billion to get out to the women. I have been there. In Kenya, they have said the same. Cute political statements, but the women don't get it. It will go through systems that by the time it gets to the women, it's no longer there. So we are left scratching. And now that the donor money is going, what we are working on, we are left telling the women, how do we create assets? So that is another thing we have established. So we do need to get women creating assets and wealth that is controlled by them 
And that's why I like FAWA, because FAWA is holistic in the sense that it is looking at women's businesses are not just about money. You can pump money in, and they don't ever get anything for women. It requires financial and non-financial services. It requires technical support. It requires creating enabling environments. It requires changing mindsets with governments and private sector as well. Thank God in Kenya now we have realized that we can also not move, by the way, we can't move without liaising with private sector. And private sector is also realizing the women is a big market. So we cannot. But where are the institutions? Don't tell me we'll put the money through banks, through financial funds. Yes, it will get there. But how do you trickle it down to the woman who requires not only that money, requires a market linkage, requires training to be able to produce the quality products that are required in the market and market chain. So it requires specific institution for specific levels of women, specific strategies that understand exactly what women need. At Kenya Women, we get into an area and the first thing I do, not me, with everybody else, I'm not the only one, 4,000 people working with me, the first thing they do is find out what exactly is required in that market. If it is water, clean water, we'll engage with the people in there, and in particular women, that is their docket, and create a water product that they are going to benefit from, that they will feel part of it, but you also look at sustainability levels. How do you do that? You can only do it working with the women. So for me, unless we get off our high white horses, go down, be real, commit, commit, and commitment requires everybody to say, I am going to do this. It begins with you people sitting in this, in this room. To say, I commit to bringing five women businesses, not I commit to bringing business, women businesses, because you are not accountable to certain parameters, to certain targets that we can come here next year and say, oh yes, we were here last year. Through FAWE, we have reached so many women. Through FAWE, we have created so many businesses for women, and we have moved women from one level to the other. We discovered through Women's World Banking and through Kenya Women, the women move from one level to the other. They don't remain the same. So you do need to disaggregate in gender terms, and this was, uh, was discussed. What are women doing at different levels as compared to what you know, their counterparts are doing and where do we come in? We need to target women. I think we need to target policies, strategies, and approaches. Right now, in Kenya, banks are running, and I'm sure you know other African countries most probably, they are running after women. They have cute retail products for all women, running after them, because they know they will repay their loans. If they, women don't need free things. They need access. They need timely responses, and they need respect when we get to those halls. That is why I have a Kenya Women Microfinance Bank where women can get into the house, breastfeed in designated rooms, come and rest. If a woman is not feeling well and she wants to rest, she can sit down and rest. Other banks will not provide that. It's unique, but it's very important. Ladies and just gentlemen, let's strategize from women's lenses. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Admasu Tades, you've been sitting there very patiently. Let's get the view from a regional bank. What is uh, your role or your roles uh, in servicing women entrepreneurs, and why do you think there still exists this huge gap? Well, first of all, Mr. Moderator, you never told me I'd be the last man on the panel. <laughs> 
the last man standing. So um, I should say I'm quite comfortable in the corner here. I think um, the, the panelists have uh, put across such a rich perspective. It makes it very easy for me to just say I agree with everything that's been said. <laughs> I, I think my contribution perhaps to add value is to say um, execution really is where the issue is now. I think the analysis is first class. I think uh, ADB through AFAW has done excellent work to bring out the issues in such a clear way. Uh, what needs to be done is very clear. Uh, PTA Bank is a regional bank. We're not a deposit-taking bank, but we have regional centers. We do corporate finance. We do trade finance. And of course, the enterprise universe is, is, is what we serve. And of course, we see a whole range of enterprises, and we see practically the, the constraints of access to finance. The constraints, I think, to be honest, is, is across a very wide realm. Of course, uh, women entrepreneurs uh, face a particular constraint, but whether it's youth or men or infrastructure or industry or agribusiness, there's a huge access issue across the board. And I think that sort of sometimes raises the question, to mainstream or not to mainstream? What is perhaps the fine balance there? And I think, I think it's both clearly because as we've heard from the panelists, the, the challenges and the constraints are not just at the level of the firm. There are massive ecosystem issues, there are cultural issues, there are legal issues, there's mindset issues. These don't reside at the level of institutions or, or corporates as such, even though they do manifest there. So I think clearly the need to have special interventions is, is, is very clear to me in any case. Uh, we, um, I think financial institutions are, are not able to address many of the, the systemic issues that have been highlighted. So I think there is definitely need for that. Uh, our experience actually has been quite good, and uh, quite good in the sense that the school of thought that suggests women don't need special terms uh, has been borne out in our own experience because we've had very successful clients, award-winning female clients who've grown businesses from scratch and who've diversified into uh, a whole range of sectors. And um, we've, seen, we've seen women being very successful. And it's not just at a level of our clients. In fact, um, when people ask issues of mindset and they say, are you gender conscious? Are you aware? Are you enabling? I say, well, maybe the best way to explain to you is my credit committee is chaired by a woman. Our head of corporate finance is a woman. Our head of equity finance is a woman. Our head of strategy is a woman. The chairman of my board is a woman. So it's not, it's not just about saying the right things. Eh? We, we actually have a very well diversified bank. And it helps us a great deal because we are able to, to see things through the right set of lens. Right? We, we are able to appreciate all kinds of business segments for the value that they bring us as a business. But of course, uh, that said and done, we, um, we are very committed to specialized interventions. We think that uh, there are still a lot of uh, constraints and obstacles, uh, especially in some countries. I don't think it's a uniform story, but uh, there are probably countries that need a special push and more facilities. Um, and of course, for PTA Bank as an execution partner, we'd be very happy to, to work uh, with AFAWA ADB has been a strategic partner for us for many years. Uh, we, of course, uh, take this opportunity very seriously and uh, we'll, uh, we'll do everything within our power to, uh, to make it real and not just talk about it in panels. So maybe I'll stop at this point and then come back in again. Thank you very much. We're going to turn to our discussions, but before I do that, I'd just uh, I'd like to pick up on uh, one of the points that both uh, Jennifer and uh, Admas who uh, made about execution and about whether this money will actually get to the woman. And we're, we're lucky to have Stephen Natalambi, uh, VP of the bank. Uh, maybe you could give us a word on, on execution and how, how we're going to get this right and, and the money's not just going to disappear. Thank you, everybody, and thank you for this great panel. Um, from the bank side, basically, this is, of course, this is uh, the execution part is the most complex, but we've already got a history of working with... Uh, because we're going to be basically working on uh, starting off with le lending and TA, technical assistance. And we have, the, we have a facility called the SME, facility, sorry, 
where we do lending on small size, uh, and of course it depends women in businesses different sizes, uh, but we will be using that model which has a fast track system in the, in, the, in the institution, so it allows us to be more effective. We're actually going to be carving out to start off $150 million uh, for that, and we hope to crowd in also, of course, others, along, hopefully PTA Bank will be one of them, to support us in this uh, for at least the same amount. The idea being that we'll be most probably sharing due diligence and finding ways to sort of cut costs as well from our perspective as bankers, but also to make sure that we do um, target the right clients. And of course, the scoping study that we're actually doing right now is going to help us really make sure that we do um, target the market. And as you rightly mentioned, women are of different, they're different types of women, they're different types of needs, and we have to make sure that we find and uh, really cater for those different types of needs. Thank you. Ah, yes, sorry, on the I, I, uh, you mentioned, um, thank you, Geraldine, um, you mentioned the issue about the, the identity, and we, we're actually not working on the identity issue, but where we are working on is in the, in the mobile banking space. We're actually setting up, a, and this is different from Afawa, but of course it will link up with all the women's issues, and we're actually setting up a digital financial inclusion fund. We're working with the Gates Foundation, and in that work, part of the work is very much linked to the the, the mobile bank has created a whole new load of opportunities on the data front. And in fact, it has allowed us, and I'm sure PTA Bank is experiencing this as well through the banking that they are doing with mobile banking. What happens is through the, through the mobile phone, you actually have, you discover the behavior of every individual. And you actually understand their behavior in terms of when they spend, when they save, what they spend on. And of course, that you create a history without asking them to create the history. And for the bankers, this is, this is go a goldmine. Of information, and in fact, now we have, of course, the big data firms trying to actually make money out of this and selling this on to the bankers. This might be done by telcos, but it's usually done by intermediaries. But it's an important component uh, because it's going to actually help us all um, identify. Uh, and as, as was mentioned, there's different strata of women in terms of businesses, what their needs are, and especially this is for the small and micro uh, needs. It's going to be extremely important to help us. Uh, really target the right people. And this is being used already in Kenya, is an example where Equity Bank, uh, CBA, um, several of the banks are already leveraging this data to really target the women. And sometimes it becomes, well, in certain, in certain cases, it ends up being, becoming a bit of like harassment even for the individuals because you're receiving all these messages, SMSs on your phone because they, they, they realize how, what is your behavior and they're looking to entice you into borrowing. So there also we have to make sure that we don't get people to be using too much of this money uh, in, for, for not the right reasons. Thank you. Thanks very much. Depressing to hear telemarketing has already arrived. <laughs> um, well, we've, we've assembled some, some very eminent discussants who can bring some of their perspectives on these issues. And, and let, let us turn to our host, Zambia. Uh, we have the uh, Deputy Central Bank Governor, Dr. Tukia Kankasa Mabula. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about how you managed to make progressive reforms uh, in a, a male-dominated institution like the Central Bank and, and beyond? I presume you didn't face any resistance at all. <laughs> Maybe you could stand up. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to participate in this discussion. And um, as Jennifer said, yes, indeed, we need execution, execution, execution. But also these um, discussions do serve a value. We've learned a lot, I think, um, as a central bank from partnerships and participating in some of these uh, fora. Uh, we're able to, have, to be exposed and to look at you know, what is possible. Uh, as Bank of Zambia, we have put gender on the agenda of the central bank. And indeed, uh, when we, maybe I could, I don't know, give me my. When we began, the legitimacy of what we were doing was actually questioned. That, you know, what, what business does a central bank have on, in the issue of gender? And uh, most people look at the issue of gender as something that's done by uh, mainstream government. You know, they uh, subscribe to all these uh, international conventions and it's for government. Bank of Zambia, we're the central bank. Uh, we have two responsibilities, one for macroeconomic stability. The other one, we regulate the financial 
sector. But people were questioning, you know, what does gender have to do with us? Including with, internally within uh, the central bank without identifying specific critical departments that didn't see their role with gender. But with advocacy and, you know, making the case and making people understand, I think we have moved, we've made quite a lot of progress. Um, what we began with uh, was a participatory gender audit within the central bank itself to understand ourselves, where are we? And um, that exercise was uh, quite an exercise because in fact, some people were confronting the issue of gender for the very first time in their lives. And these are people who were working in the, in the central bank. And of course, there was uh, some resistance. At one point, we had a workshop offsite the governor had to be called in, and uh, there I have an example of what it means to have male champions. We had, uh, the governor was very much behind the initiative, so he went down and said, we believe in the issue of equality as a central bank. We believe in the issue of um, economic empowerment of women. We're in a vantage position to do something about that, and that's how it was um, uh, settled. And I saw us move from a position of um, resistance, people uh, being politically correct, saying the right things that they think want to be heard, to now a point where people are realizing, you know, what are the issues and how important it is for us to work in this space. And one of the things that we did do was move, uh, the gender policy initially resided in HR, which was, you know, uh, people's original thinking that that's where it, sh it is. It has now been moved into a strategy and risk uh, department, and sits in the change and in innovation division of that. And that is part of our process to mainstream um, the issue. And uh, obviously at the beginning, there was a lot of um, concern, particularly by our members of staff, that maybe this was just something to advance women, particularly women within the central bank itself. And our approach is two-pronged, actually. You know, um, increasing the number of women uh, in senior decision-making, participation in decision-making, as well as engendering the financial sector. But internally, there was that concern that maybe this is just a way to promote women and, you know, uh, take our jobs away and so on. But um, we have worked, and uh, the, the main work that we are doing uh, uh, immediately is that we've been working with the financial service providers, starting with central banks, and we have some of the chief executives here, I think, who can speak for themselves. Perhaps, I think the advocacy has really been good, making people understand what is the fuss about, why are we working um, in this space. And we found that within the central bank itself, we had to work very hard to mainstream the issue. Initially, it was an add-on kind of issue, but you know, the risk of that is that maybe if the champion leaves, the whole thing falls on its face and, and dies. Uh, I'm glad to say that uh, this issue has really been mainstreamed within uh, the central bank to the point that initially everything that had to do with gender was the office of the deputy governor administration. But now, sometimes I don't even know what members of staff are doing. And, you know, I, I, I get uh, maybe one of the chief executives talking to me about an initiative, thinking it has come from my office, but it has come from um, bank supervision or non-bank supervision or some other department that is uh, pushing this. And I think central banks are in a very good place to respond to this issue of access to finance. And how this, uh, the story began is we would get all these complaints of you know, lack of access by women to finance. And uh, we uh, began first by creating a platform. We actually invited uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, Chief Executives of, uh, of um, uh, commercial banks, other uh, chief executives of financial service providers to meet together with the women, the uh, entrepreneur women. And this we did in the month of the women entrepreneur. So we created this platform for dialogue. And it was a very good um, exercise which resulted into some, some relationships, in fact, right from there between uh, some of the entrepreneurs and um, uh, the financial service providers. The financial service providers were able to hear firsthand the complaints from the uh, women um, entrepreneurs. And I think the, the flagship that we are implementing is 
a tool that has been developed by the ILO. Maybe there are some members from the ILO, and uh, uh, we have this valued partnership. It's called the FAMOS Check, Female and Male Operated Small Enterprises. So that's what FAMOS stands for. It's a self-check that's supposed to be done by the financial service uh, providers. And the essence of this tool is to make them look at how are they doing business, how well are they serving the women market segment. Uh, the tool is actually for both men and women, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of uh, that fact. And I think it will help the financial service providers also serve their male clients better. But for, this, for the purpose uh, of um, uh, our current exercise, we're trying to encourage them to look at how are they serving their women clientele. And when they've done this self-check, uh, they draw up a logical action plan of how they are going to respond to what they have found. It looks at about six main areas, such as their outreach, their procedures, and more importantly, their strategies. Do their strategies actually say anything about these um, farmers? clients, both men um, and women. So um, something else that we found as a central bank is that uh, we needed to create capacity. And we did uh, train uh, members of our staff at a fairly senior level to facilitate these farmers checks. We also trained members of staff of uh, the financial service providers to do the check within themselves. So, well, maybe I can stop here for now. Um, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, M maybe. Actually, I've heard that the Nigerian, we've kind of been competing a little bit the, with the Nigerian Central Bank. I don't know if you can speak with, uh, for them. Um, no, you cannot. Okay. I'm happily no longer in government. Yes. <laughs> so I want to speak for myself. <laughs> Okay, Which maybe I can, I, can, I can ask you, uh, what, what, what do you think, what more do you think central banks could do? Having been Minister of Finance, what, what more do you think central banks could do to advance this cause? Oh, I think central banks can do a lot because they regulate the financial sector in many of our countries. In some countries, you have another regulator of banking systems, but many of the African countries, the central banks are the regulators. So you could require these banks you know, um, to put in place these KPIs that my sister was talking about, to report to you on how they, uh, you know, disburse their credit, how much goes to women, why it's not going, without mandating certain percentages, because I don't really believe in that, because people will use, circumvent it in one way, but you could put in place, through your regulatory mechanism, rules, guidelines, and requirements for results and reporting that could really shift the goal, uh, shift uh, very substantially, uh, you know, the way that women are treated. Now we come back to I asked this question and it's come up. Execution. We've had IFC giving uh, channeling money through banks. We've had so many institutions channeling, and uh, we have them success at the small level. I think what we're saying in this room is that. We are tired of pilot successes. We want to scale up. In order to do that scaling up, central banks have the power. So I'll put the question back to you. How are you going to change the guidance in Zambia? In fact, in fact I'd like to come in here as well. Central banks have a very big role to play. Because central banks react very negatively sometimes and very punitively to institutions that are, de that are dealing with, with majority women are in those institutions, are managed by those institutions. The regulations of central banks do not favor other institutions that work with the poor people. The, the kind of, if you come, for example, the, the, an example of Kenya, big microfinance institution like Kenya women working with this over a million women currently. And the, the, if you look at the regulations that, 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 uh, uh, that you know, the, the, provisioning, the provisioning rules, the, the one-day loan late is provided for. At the end of the month, 
you, you find a person uh, in an institution is as more money in provisions than with the people it is serving. That's just one example. I think central banks have a, a role to make sure that the environment, the access to regulated environments help to create atmosphere for business. For small businesses, not only for women, but even for men. Yes, I'm, I'm glad to say I, I see the Deputy Executive Director of AFI is here, Mr. Mumba. Uh, central banks, um, about 2014, we asked ourselves the question, what role do central banks have in the issue of uh, um, you know, uh, financial inclusion of women? Um, and uh, AFI looks generally at the issue of uh, um, financial inclusion. I think th um, sensitizing central banks to this issue, and I agree that all central banks need to be in included in this issue of financial inclusion, not just women, but particularly women, because women can be left behind. And um, as uh, Ngozi said, there's this persistent gender gap, financial inclusion uh, gender gap, so something needs to be done. I believe that when central banks are more sensitive to this issue, even um, the issue of provisioning, the issue of how uh, products uh, developed. For example, if a woman runs a business on her, uh, on her own and she goes on maternity leave, should a product be tailored in such a way that she has a grace period from making the payments and so on? And I think those kind of things will only come about if you're consciously looking, as someone said, through the gender lenses as you create uh, these products. Ngozi, I'm glad to tell you that as the Bank of Zambia, we are actually have introduced a credit monitoring uh, system where we are collecting gender dis disaggregated uh, data and the uh, financial service providers have begun to um, provide that information. At the moment, we're not really in a position where we can give very uh, definitive statistics. But I think in another two, three years, we'll be in a position where we can actually give those statistics. Something else that we have done is we have put in our um, strategic plan a, strate a strategic objective of gender mainstreaming uh, internally within the Bank of Zambia and externally in the sector that we supervise. And we, ha we have put in there KPIs. So we are going to be monitoring what are we doing, you know, how well are we doing, what else do we need to be doing. And um, I'm actually the co-chair of the AFI High Level Committee on Women's Financial Inclusion, and I'll make sure that I commit to make sure that other central banks are also doing a lot in this sector. Thanks very much. Mr. Holbrook, uh, since I'm no longer intimidated, oh, okay. Uh, I'd just like to just jump in for a moment and say that I think central banks clearly have a role to play, but I would be very encouraged to hear more pressure being put on ministries of justice, ministries of education, ministries of information. I think it's quite possible they may have a bigger impact on leveling the playing field because I think the central banks uh, have um, a role to play, but maybe not as big as the others. I'm going to disagree to make this a little more interesting. I think central banks have the bully pulpit. If we look in country after country, one of the most well-respected individuals is the central bank governor. We expect to hear our central bank governors talking about monetary policy, the exchange rate, balance of payments, bank supervision. But to hear a central bank governor using the amount of time allotted at a press conference, at a public speaking event, to talk about gender, I think it's a force multiplier. And so I would urge central bank governors to just take the two minutes to speak about gender, and I think it will send very positive ripples throughout the economy. Fantastic. And it's so great to hear that the Zambian central bank is, is taking this issue so seriously. Um, uh, now let's speak to Sidi Ulta from the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa. Um, how is your DFI uh, having a positive impact on women's empowerment and uh, how can you help contribute to AFAWA? Thank you. Uh, the body as the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa has been uh, uh, providing financing to support women 
in uh, sub-Saharan African countries since 1975. But the main shift was with, with the new strategic plan covering the period 2015-2019, which gives a special focus on empower, uh, women empowerment, youth empowerment, and private sector development. Now, we, we have been discussing with Afawa, and uh, Geraldine has been uh, really a very good partner for us. And we are now trying to uh, link Afawa to our sister ins financial institutions, six uh, Arab financial institutions, which are also interested in supporting Afawa. So Badea will play the role of catalyst to bring uh, financial support, but also technical assistance in form of grants to support in a holistic approach uh, the development of uh, uh, Afawa uh, in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. But uh, since, I am, uh, since I have the mic, I would like to, to, to ask a, a question. <laughs> and my question is to, to the CEO of PTA. Uh, women empowerment and women financial inclusion requires innovative uh, instruments. What will be, according to uh, PTA, will be the uh, added value of AFAWA and what PTA can do uh, in financial innovation to improve the financial inclusion of women? Thank you. Maybe if, uh, if you answer this question, then I see that we've been uh, joined by the president, so after your response, we can go to that. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, for PTA Bank, I think already we've had a fairly good run in terms of uh, providing intermediation of uh, credit to uh, financial institutions that are closer to the ground and more specialized and better able uh, to reach smaller borrowers, which in many cases uh, is the complexion of the landscape. So that is quite classical. I think we've heard uh, colleagues on the panel talk about channeling funding through FIs. We've been one of them. I, I, think, I think what is perhaps more interesting on the innovation side is maybe to have a special purpose fund. Uh, AFAWA clearly is a very welcome initiative. I think it, it's going to make a big impact. But I think uh, risk capital is a specific constraint, I think, for women businesses. And risk capital is not... Uh, as straightforward as loan finance. I think it's a different ball game. Uh, venture capital, private equity, that is perhaps a little bit more uh, considerate of the issues that women entrepreneurs face. I think there's been reference to uh, specific uh, roles around mentoring, coaching, those kinds of adjunct services that can come with private equity. I think that would be quite innovative. I don't think we see much of that. I think the continent as a whole, actually, whether it's women or youth, are really starved of risk capital. So risk capital type instruments would be very helpful to have, uh, supported with non-financial services. It could be information, it could be training, it could be networking, it could be clinics. And I think we're talking about instruments and facilities that can go hand in hand to unlock the potential of, of these kinds of uh, borrowers. That said, I think uh, for, for PTA Bank, our future uh, initiative will be very much linked to what AFAWA is trying to achieve. So we uh, are very excited about this initiative and we will work very closely with the African Development Bank to, to make it a reality. Thank you. Thanks very much. Now, um, uh, about a year ago, President Adeshina paid us the honor of a visit in our offices in Paris. And uh, we know where he's there is explaining the program, the high five. And he said that he was you know, really going to take the empowerment of women seriously. More for me, I just assumed this was uh, you know, one of the good things that you say when you're on a campaign. But we're here today, and uh, clearly you've uh, put your money where your mouth is. Please, uh, won't you take the podium and, and explain to the audience uh, your thinking behind this? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let, let me first thank you. Uh, it's good to see Marisa and uh, my big sister uh, Ngozi, and also uh, the CEO of the Women uh, uh, Finance uh, Bank in Kenya and Tadase, and all of you that are here. Uh, let me particularly thank 
uh, Geraldine. She's done a fabulous job. She continues to do a fabulous job in pulling this together. Um, and when we looked at the issue of women, I just want to make a few comments. One is a personal experience. When I supervised a PhD student in, 19, about ni in the early 1990s uh, in Nigeria, that PhD student did a study looking at the adoption of soybean. Soybean became a cash crop in Nigeria, and they were using it for women uh, to, uh, to, to do nutritious foods and all of that. And so women were making a lot of money. And so he went and did this study, and I still remember the PhD study very well, and found out that the women said, this particular woman said in a, a, a city of Jos, said, I sell my soybean, it's a cash crop. I make money from soybean. I send my kids to school. I actually feed my kids very well, and you can see they're very healthy. I buy myself a very nice wrapper that looks like my big sister and goes his wrapper. <laughs> and I also build myself a house. And then she said, soybean is like my husband. He said, but if you have money and you have soybean, what else do you need in a husband? <laughs> It just tells you what happens when you empower women. When you empower women, you change the livelihoods of every single body, everybody in the household. Everything changes. And so that's why I said that when women win, Africa wins. Because whether it is nutrition, whether it is health, whether it is education, whether it's livelihood of society, everything revolves around that. The second experience I want to share is about structural adjustment. I went on a flight from Abidjan. Uh, from Lagos to Abidjan during the period of structural adjustment. And of course, there was massive amount of layoffs during that time, so the men lost a lot of their jobs. But in fact, it was the women that kept Africa going. The businesses of women kept Africa going. And I got on this plane, and I had my small bag, and at that time, if you remember the compact... Uh, you know, the, the computer that used to be like a box, the one that we used to carry. That was all I had, and I got on the plane. And I tried to put it up uh, in times uh, just to get a space. And there were market women all over the place. They were carrying baskets. They were carrying clothes and everything. And I was just a scientist just trying to find a place to put my computer. And the hair hostess said, excuse me, can you please take your uh, computer bag away? I said, it's the only luggage I have. He says, you are not that important on this flight. <laughs> he said, the market women own this plane. <laughs> so they had to take my computer bag away so that she can put their things there. And he asked me, how many, how many times do you fly this plane? I said, well, when needed. He said, they fly it every single day. They bring in clothes from Nigeria. They go to Abidjan. They finish, they go back. He says, sir, can you please just take your seat because this is uh, the market women's plane. That's the second point that I want to, uh, 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 to make. Now, as we look at the high fives that we are rolling out, I think the success of all of this depends on what we do for women. Let me take the case of energy. We've got 700 million people that don't have access to energy. We lose 600,000 people that die every year. 300,000 of them are women and 300,000 of them are children under the age of five. In other words, the family is still affected by it. So we cannot succeed on energy unless we succeed first with the issue of women. The Afawa that, um, uh, you can sit down until I finish here. Yeah. Afawa, where's Gerardin, yeah. Um, Afawa is our effort to actually get financing for women at scale. When I was in Nigeria as a minister, Minister Ngozi was the Minister of Finance. She did a fabulous program called GWIN. And I was in the Ministry of Agriculture doing a program called Youth Employment in Agriculture Program. And I was amazed with that GWIN initiative, how much opportunities it created for so many of the uh, women in Nigeria, and how many of them began to have great businesses. And one of the initiatives that I supported our Minister of Agriculture in Nigeria on this youth employment and agriculture program concerned the case of a lady. Her name is called Awa Belo. Awa Belo. 
Our bailer, we gave her a grant of five million, um, five million naira. She began to make bags. She had her own tannery. And then from there, she began to make nice bags. About a year after, she was invited by the London Fashion Week to come and showcase her handbags. When I got the handbags, I ran to Minister Ngozi's office. I know she's a very great person with design of African stuff. And I rushed, you remember, I came to your office and I gave you those bags. I have them. Yeah, great. <laughs> and I said, uh, my big sister, this bag is trendy. It's better than any Vogue bag. And she agreed. She knows fashion. So. But today, I was so proud when our Bello was featured on CNN. And today, our Bello's bags are better than any of the Vogue bags you can find in Paris or Italy or anywhere. And that came out of a grant of five million. Now, Auntie Ngozi, how much is that? Uh, five, five million. Well, we were, let's see, today or? Then. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, roughly about, um, let's see, a million was about uh, 10, 5 million. Uh, about 25,000 dollars. Yes. Like and today, Please just Google her. The thing is called Madame Coquet. Madame Coquet. That's our below. Her bags, I want to advertise you know, for you. That's what happens when you support women. They deliver. When it comes to issue of payment, Adasi was talking about it, 97% of women pay back their loans. The remaining 3% they don't pay back their loans. They don't pay it back because the men stop them paying back on their way to paying it. <laughs> So our affirmative finance action for women is to give that affirmative action necessary for our banks to lend to women. Even without collateral, they pay back. And so we believe in women, and we believe that Africa cannot succeed unless we support women. And please, this fund is so crucial for us in agriculture, in service industries, in trade, in all areas, small and medium-sized enterprises. Let's turn Africa as an Africa with inclusive growth, supporting women because the future lies on what we do for women. And so I just want to thank you all very much, Marisa and everybody, Auntie Gozi, and, and, and also, uh, my, sorry, my big uh, sister from uh, 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 Jennifer and also Tadese and everybody for your support. And I believe that this fund, we want to leverage up to, is it three? Three billion dollars for women. And three billion dollars for women. How many of you think that's uh, too much for women? I, I see no hands up. We should do more. So thank you all very much in partnership. Let's make it happen. We're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. We spoke audacity, and I think you've heard it all. Um, there was the question that came from Jennifer. Is it just another talk shop? Um, if you were both in the governor's dialogue this morning, or you recall the opening yesterday, the president actually said that he's going to hold everyone to uh, clear performance contracts. Um, I think that goes for our partners potentially as well. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's a perfect segue from Sorghum to uh, Manal Abdel Munayn. You run uh, Sobek, Trade and Development, very active uh, in helping bring uh, women farmers. Uh, into more commercial structures. Um, now, let's say that I'm running the board of AFAWA and I decide to give you the, the $100 million. What would you do with it? You'd buy some bags from Awabella, no doubt. Well, thank you very much. First of all, if you, if you give me $100 million, uh, you have to tell me, is it a loan or is it a grant? <laughs> <laughs> it, it all, all depends on the terms of this gift. No, actually, from a, a private uh, sector perspective, I will not go through what all the panelists here have said because I've left you in. Everybody said a superb, eloquent uh, speech. I think the, the role of private sector is to bring something at the table, and this is something very important. Um, I, I definitely women, they have different roles and different challenges across the value chain of whatever industry we're talking about. Is it agribusiness? Um, and definitely not in the uh, 
um, how do I say, the, the, the normal labor, if they are employed somewhere, that's okay, that's no problem. And the biggest employer in all the African countries is the government. The second is the agriculture sector as a whole, where they are employed. Um, I, I, we have been privileged to, to travel a lot in, in Africa, and especially in rural areas that I love, and I definitely see women struggle at the, at the most important uh, level, which is the first level of agriculture, which is the farming. Um, definitely struggle not only for a finance, but for the pattern, the way to do business, and the way to work together, and the way to have commitment. And that's why I agree very much with Mr. Tennessee. There is, in some cases, the, the, the finance is available in banks, be it for men or for women. It's just the women, they don't know how to access that be it by lack of education, a lot, I mean, in different countries, I will not name countries, a lot of women in that particular rural area, they don't read and write, so they have to go through another level. That's why we, we've encouraged wherever we went, women to form a kind of association or a cooperative, where at least it will be easier to, to deal with some representative, and they know each other very well. So, I mean, it will be very difficult and again, I, gave, I said the, the, the uh, example I mentioned yesterday, our aim was to do some added value industry from like processing, et cetera, et cetera. It was the most, the most big challenge that made us a bit stop is how can we secure that the farmer will bring the input to the factories? Because this for them, there is no, the commitment is not there. They're not trained to deal in an ecosystem. There's, that's for we said, okay, let's hold a bit and we try to help them to have association. Even if there are a hundred of them, they can, have, they can select a representative and then the representative will go and talk and then we can deal with this representative, with association or a cooperative. And that, that, that's a level because that's why you see that in this value chain, there are much more women at the number one chain, but when you go to like trading, export, import, there are less uh, women, as you might say, entrepreneur, although I think that at this level, women are able to create jobs, and it is not a big problem. I, I, can, I hear everybody talking about the empowerment as owning a business. I, I don't see it this way very much. I think that it's a partnership where you can have the women owning business or men owning business. Uh, if we talk uh, here, I mean, I'm, I'm really sorry that uh, uh, he left Ashish. He's a man, he's an entrepreneur, but he is, he, he, a lot of women are working in his organization. We are, not tell, we are not going to tell him, no, you, I don't have access to any finance related to women because you, it's not a woman-owned business. Does it matter who owns a business? You can go in a marketplace and you find a company listed in a stock market Today is a woman running as a CEO, tomorrow it's a man. What's important is the body, the core of who is working there. And I think if the private sector is bringing capital, is bringing money, is bringing some innovative uh, financial, like if we, have, if we have a lot of women, part of a company, we provide insurance, health insurance, you provide sometimes some, you, you aid them for education, a lot of things, and I think, I wonder what, if, uh, if I talked about the Afawa and your 100 million, will it be targeted directly to give money directly to a woman or a business where they're women or indirect finance, like training? Because there, there is very easy for us to go to the bank and give a business plan, which is a bankable dash commercial. But when we want to have capacity building, when we want to have training, when we want to have platform where all these ladies, for instance, can exhibit their product, this is where it is not commercial. You cannot quantify this because it has an indirect, of course, um, input to the business, but we cannot say, if I'm going to train 10, it will come to this r, &R. We, we don't, we, it's, it's very difficult. So I think the, the AFAWA, will have a very important role to fill the gaps of the simple go and finance by educating women that there is finance somewhere there. And there is maybe to help some of the companies to give them incentives. Like if you have a quota, sometimes you have to work with a quota just to initiate women to go out there. Like in the parliament, you say there is a quota for 60 for the first maybe two rounds of parliament and then you leave it free because the people will be already they have the, uh, they've seen women performing, and if they don't perform, that's tough luck for women at the, at the bottom line. But for the finance, I think 
you need to educate because laws in most of the African country where I visited, that in, when we see to the law, there is no difference between men and women. And it's not only tradition, it is also lack of education. They don't know their right. That's why communication is very important. Campaign, awareness campaign is very, very important. Awareness campaign where women will know that they have the right. What was uh, Dr. Adeshina just said now, this is a very big threat for some society, I think. When a man will hear that an empowered woman can simply say, I prefer a soya bean than my husband, well, the husband will flip. I mean, he will not be happy at all. <laughs> to hear that if the woman is empowered, she will not need him. And that's why he will not tell, ask her to go to the bank. And that's, it is very important, the social cohesion here, that they will help each other. That on the contrary, if a man brings to the home $100 a month, maybe by both of them working and helping each other, they complete each other. We compete, but we complete each other. Because otherwise, it is a big problem. And this is exactly what made sometimes men leashed I mean, the capacity of the woman to go and be, in a way, independent. It, it, that's why I would not like the word independent. I think it's a complementarity. It's a family unit. Social cohesion is extremely important because it is the sustainability of societies. It's a sustainability for an ecosystem that we all need to preserve at one point. Therefore, I think for private business, we, we, we are happy, of course, to, to inject capital, to inject working capital, to bring the equity where we can train women to be a part of a corporate, and then they are, they are much more self-confident, and you can come fill the gap of education, of awareness, of grant, of having a platform where this company hiring, employing, or partnering with a lot of women can exhibit whatever they do, being in industry, being in forum, forum led by, by ladies. Just I think this is what, what we look at, filling the gap for a non-commercial aspect to tell women, go out there, and if you work in a place where you can perform, where you have initiative, where you have, you have a salary, so you have a minimum wage, where you know that you have a minimum income, then you bring, after that, the non-commercial part coming from something like this. And this is what's, that's how I will utilize your 100 million. But I'll take a part as a grant for sure. <laughs> I mean, it has a, a, grant, a grant component is always important, <laughs> whatever it is. My sisters and brothers, let me remind you, years of exclusion have relegated women to a point where they have no voice and they don't believe in themselves. The few women you see in SM sector are just a very small minority of the women that are going to transform Africa. The majority of the women have been, you know, exclusion dehumanizes. And it makes people have no voice and no trust in themselves. Take, for example, I'll give you an example. Last year, I received 10 houses from Malaysia. It's a new in a house, Koto, 10 houses, uh, as a gift. And they have landed in Kenya. If I wanted to sell those houses, I would get 10,000 for each Koto house, and they would go like this in Kenya. But I decided, no, mm. women are not thinking of changing their housing. I am going to look for very poor women, donate my foundation donate these houses to these women. We work with these women in a few communities to let them see, yes, I can improve my family if I'm borrowed from a commercial bank. To improve my home, this is what would happen. Now, that same money would have been put there as a fund for women to come and borrow. And you tell me they will come and borrow it. They won't borrow it because they have been made to believe this is the status that is relegated to them by God. And, I, and I'm telling you, I've worked with, even with you know, women in the, in the SME sector who come and tell me, no, mama, I'm not going to take this loan because you see, God did not want me to do differently than I'm doing. We really need to be realistic if we are serious about getting Africa from where it is. Can we 
see what is it we are going to commit to you where you are as an investor to make sure that those mindsets and to make sure that where most women are, let's not look just at the SME sector. I love them, I have them, they, they are the ones I call mixed portfolio in my portfolio. And <laughs> they are mixed portfolio in my portfolio. But the majority who will move this Africa are both the SME and the small woman. And they will require different handling and treatment and institutions that understand them and can deliver to them. And those are the institutions that FAWE must find out. FAWE must find out who they are. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mzinga Mello, you're the CEO of Barclays Africa Management. Let's get the, the corporate banking view on this. Tell us a little bit about how, how you see the problem. No, thank you so much, uh, Geraldine and uh, ADB, for, for this opportunity. Uh, let, let me just start by... Um, acknowledging what uh, Madam Ngozi, my sister, has said on the informal sector. Uh, because I think, uh, you know, I really liked what she said about um, what you've done in Ghana and Nigeria about registering a lot of those businesses and then they, they contribute to the tax base. And maybe I'll ask my question in advance in terms of what can Africa do to really expand the tax base? Because I think when the tax base expands, you find that, you know, it has a, you know, a knock-on effect to a a number of big issues the industry faces, like, say, interest rates and uh, a number of bigger issues. If you look at a country like Zambia, where we have, you know, about 13 million people, probably maybe less than two or 300,000 people pay tax. And that becomes, you know, a big Africa issue. So I, I found that point uh, very profound. Um, and uh, Madam Jennifer, I totally agree with you that I think we need to look at the the SMEs and the small businesses, you know, in a manner that, you know, looks at them as individuals and what do they have to bring to the table, you know, in order for us to support them, understand their businesses in their own right, as opposed to doing the traditional way, uh, you know, of dealing with it where, you know, we put them in one bag and say, you know, for these SMEs, you know, this is a credit pr criteria that we're going to use. Um, so talk a little bit about what we are doing, you know, uh, you know, as as Barclays there. But I think from a uh, from a gender point of view, I think what we are really proud of is uh, we are really pushing the gender, uh, you know, uh, the uh, the gender agenda, so to say. Because if you look at, at our chairperson, uh, you know, Wendy Lucas Bo. Uh, you know, she's a lady, Maria Ramos is a lady, and we're pushing for all the boards, you know, across Africa to at least 50% be women. Because we believe that the decisions are made at that table, at the board level. So if the 50% are women, then right across the clientele, they'll be pushing that agenda to say, what about the women? So we believe it starts there. It's all very well having women managers, but we believe the board is where it starts. So we are pushing all our board members that when you look at the board chairs, how, what percentage do you have that are women? So if you look at a country like Kenya, we've been able to achieve that. In fact, in Kenya, we've got 60% of our board members being women. And we're seeing the agenda there really being driven. So I think for me, that's really where it starts. Um, but what we've also done is that we've got an uh, you know, APSA development uh, fund. So again, this is a fund, uh, for now we're doing it in South Africa, but we're also rolling it out on the continent. And this is really answering Madam Jennifer's question. Uh, this is really where we are saying uh, we shouldn't just look at women and startups because the biggest challenges women have are it's because either they are startups, so when they are startups and they walk through the bank, Ordinarily, banks will say, but you don't have a track record. So how can you have a track record if you have to start a business? You know, it's almost a catch-22. You want me to start a business, but you can't give me money because I'm a startup. You know, so that, that, that's really one of the biggest challenges that we've had. And uh, the other challenge that we have is we say to the women, uh, yes, you can bring your house as security. And for me, one of the most painful things I've experienced as a CEO is when I've had to foreclose and say to a woman, you were not able to pay back your loan, so bring, bring the house. It's a very, because then you stop being the CEO, you become the human being, and say, seriously, where is she going to live? This is very painful. So I think what we're pushing is, 
how do we have models where women can borrow unsecured? Because we know they pay back. So if they pay back, yes, they're allowed to be startups. How can, they, how can we have a fund that puts away the traditional way of doing business, which is, yes, you know, have you been able to bring this, okay, tick and tick and tick, and say, we're going to look at you as an individual, and we're going to assess you in your own viability and your own affordability. So that's the APSA Development ba Fund, which has started in South Africa. And we're very excited, because now we're going to roll it out right on the continent, you know, as well. But I think one of the big agendas that we are doing is the agenda of shared growth. This is really where we believe we need to create shareholder value on the continent. And that's what we've been talking about. I think the first thing that we're doing is we have to look at the inter enterprise development, where we are linking the small businesses to our corporates. The thing about banks, so if you look at a bank like Barclays, we have the big corporates and we have the small businesses. So, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, saying to the small businesses, yes, you can go and look for businesses somewhere else or who to supply to. How do you help them linking that? You know, I know our CEO, Xavier, who's in the room here, has done a great job there with the mining sector, where you are saying, yes, this is a, these are the mines that we are dealing with, but we are encouraging our small businesses to supply to the mines. Because when you do that, you don't necessarily have to start asking them for security because the value chain is able to actually resolve that. I think the second thing that we're doing is um, business development, where we are saying, yes, we've got these businesses that are developing, but how can we mentor them? You know, how can we support them with putting together business plans? And I know I'm not focusing only on women, because the challenges, you know, like our central bank governor here was saying, deputy governor, the challenges are both, you know, affect the men and the women. So we are saying, uh, you know, how do we, especially for the women, how do we support you with the innovative way of, uh, you know, putting, uh, you know, those, those proposals together so that when you come to the bank, it will be easier for us to, to support you. And the final thing, which is probably just because of time, and I know we have many other speakers, so I'm going to keep it short. Some of the, one of the big initiatives we're having is very similar to what Madame Ngozi was saying, and we're calling that ready to work. What we're doing is that we have rolled that right across Africa, including here in Zambia. And what we're saying is uh, we are partnering with the universities so that we catch the customers while they're still at school. So we catch them not so much to say you, you must come and bank with Barclays, no, but we support them in mentoring, in the skills development, in what does it mean to start a business? How do you start a business? So if they understand those fundamentals at the very young age, when we haven't got quite to registering them like Madam Gozi was saying, I was just thinking that's a good idea. I think we're going to start doing that as well. But I think for now is how do we, you know, start mentoring them, you know, at that, at that very early age? Because once it gets embedded, you know, in them when they're in school, then it's easier for them to actually do it, you know, when they grow. So we're calling that program Ready to Work, and we've launched it here in Zambia. We're launching it everywhere else, you know, on the continent uh, where we are represented. So I think th those are some of the, you know, ideas th th that we are doing. And uh, for us, we're very excited about, you know, about our women, uh, you know, client. And uh, for us, it's more, how do we make it easy for them to borrow from the banks, even if they are startups, even if they don't have the loan? Because we don't want to have the painful experience that we all go through as CEOs, where we have to say you are not able to pay back, so can you bring your house? In, so in Zambia here, you know, one of the, and this is my final point, uh, one of the, uh, you know, initiatives that we've done is called Nyamuka Zambia. We're partnering with a, uh, with a firm called Nyamuka Zamba, Zambia. Nyamuka means, you know, get up. And what we're doing there is we were running a competition for them, you know, j just to say, you know, how can you put a business proposal together for a startup? And we found that it was extremely successful because if you can do that, then it means your business becomes bankable and we can then support you right across. So those are just some of the ideas. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to, to home in on, on perhaps some, some tough questions for Afawa. Jumoke um, Dokunmu, you, you run four countries for the IFC in Southern Africa, country manager for Mozambique and Angola, among others. From your um, IFC perspective, how can something like Afawa 
actually work? What mechanisms need to be in place? How can we ensure this isn't CSR, it's not subsidy? Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start by saying banking on women is very, very good business. Um, to date, in IFC, we have provided globally in emerging markets over a billion dollars of financing to women-owned enterprises through intermediaries. We have found, and our client um, banks and partners have found, that women-owned enterprises, they experience less churn than male-owned enterprises. Women-owned enterprises pay back their loans twice more than men-owned enterprises do. We have also found that women-owned enterprises are actually are extremely profitable, much more profitable than the male-owned enterprises. Now, one key thing that we have also found is that this is not charity. The women do not want charity. They want access. And the underlying business of the woman must be financially sustainable. Maybe they need a leg up, a little leg up for a short while. But it must be financially sustainable and bankable long term. Because if, it, if you only provide it as a subsidy, at some point in time, the subsidy will end. And when, if it is only based on subsidy, once the subsidy ends, the business ends. And be, the, the main goal of this is to breed the gap of providing financing access to women. Today, there is a huge gap between women-owned enterprises who access finance and male-owned enterprises. And what we're trying to do with this, working with, hopefully with, with Afar, is to try to ensure that what we have found in, like a number of our client banks have found, we can also work together to do more of this in Africa. Um, Geraldine provided statistic earlier that in Africa today, if you include informal enterprises, there is a $30 billion financing gap for women-owned enterprises. Um, so the $1 billion you're looking for is a drop in the ocean. Now, if we all work together, ensuring that the principles of providing financing to women is exactly the same as uh, Ashish had said, level playing field, commercial enterprises, we will break the gap sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Anna Ginterman, thanks for being patient. Um, please tell us about the work of uh, your organization, Women's World Banking, in, uh, in creating you know, financial products for women. Tell us about uh, Diamond Yellow, for example. I'd, I'd love to hear about that, this partnership with the cell phone provider MTN and Diamond Bank and, and Women's World Banking. Clear with the last woman standing, <laughs> but uh, thrilled to be participating in this event together with the chair of our network, Jennifer, and also two um, advisory board members, Gozi and Geraldine. So thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, just a few words about women's role banking. For over 35 years, we've been focused on bringing access to financial services to low-income women so that they can build prosperity, security for themselves and their families. We increase access to financial services through four key areas that we believe are very much aligned with AFAVA. Uh, we work with uh, local banks to design um, products and services uh, that meet the needs of um, low-income women. Uh, those products are are designed uh, in, they're not CSR, we never work with CSR departments, they're designed to be sustainable and profitable and scalable for our partner banks. Uh, we also strengthen their commitment to the women's market by training leaders of financial institutions and helping them build um, gender diverse institutions. We also research best practices in serving the women's market and share those practices globally 
and we advocate for greater financial inclusion and work very closely with ins uh, institutions like AFI to ensure that those success stories are disseminated across the board. And uh, before I talk specifically about, um, about what a FAVA can do, um, a, a role it can play, I just want to make sure that uh, first and foremost, we understand that there is the business case in serving the women's market, and there is a market opportunity. If you look at our network, uh, which comprises of over 40 institutions in 32 countries, we see that banks that have over 75% women clients have higher ROA than banks that have less than 75% women clients. Uh, a number of uh, panelists already mentioned that women have higher repayment rates. We also know that women tend to buy more products, uh, that women have higher net NPS scores, net promotion, uh, promoter ratios. So it means that the woman is happy with your product, she would refer you to more women, and that's very, very important. And we also know that women are more loyal clients. So now I'll go to sharing some of the success stories from our network and talk um, about our work in Nigeria. And there are, of course, so many prominent Nigerians here, and myself, I want to be Nigerian. Um, uh, with Diamond Bank, I'll talk about a different product, something that's called Diamond Beta, that was designed about three years ago. And it was a product designed to address the needs of market traders. Am I holding it too closely? Um, uh, market traders um, that are majority women in Nigeria. And this was the account. So when we really look at the needs and preferences of women there. You know, what surprised us when we arrived in Nigeria, and again, there are so many Nigerians in the room, when you go to large markets, which have about two, 3,000 traders in Nigeria, um, what you see that there's always one or two bank branches right in the middle, set in the middle of the market. But when you look at what penetrations those banks have in those markets, it's about 10, 15%. And we, when we ask women, why, why don't they don't go and bank with those financial institutions that are right there? It's not about that geographical distance that we like to talk about. It's about two minutes to walk to the gate of the bank. They said two things. Uh, we uh, respect what they do. Uh, they have, we trust that they will keep our money safely, uh, but they're not for us. They're for people with money. Um, this is, uh, this, uh, so there's this beyond something that's beyond geographical distance, that that's emotional distance that we also try to address as we design products. And there was another piece. Uh, those market traders um, are there by themselves. They're self-employed women. Um, they don't have two or three workers that they can deliver the business to while they go to a bank branch and queue for two hours. So we really, thought that we needed to find a solution that would bring uh, the bank to the clients. So um, we develop a product that's called Diamond Beta, B-E-T-A as Beta. 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 I know, Beta. <laughs> I get better after three days in Nigeria uh, in saying that. Um, that um, is basically a model on the Susu, Susu collection approach that's being prevalent in West Africa for years, for decades. And it uses a sales force of better friends that go around the market and open bank accounts using mobile banking technology and can open a bank account uh, in about two minutes. And uh, then they also serve as collectors. Uh, we've also done a lot of financial education with these women in showing them on how to use this account. Uh, kind of fast forwarding four years, and now we've added to a basic savings account, um, we added a target savings feature, we added credit uh, feature that's very much based on what Marissa mentioned, kind of scoring, uh, understanding the savings behavior of these clients, understand, uh, doing the data analytics, and uh, being able to extend the loan to them. 
a pre-approval based on that behavior. So um, I think a father can play a role in really sharing successes of uh, commercial entities such as Diamond Bank that's investing millions of their own dollars in developing solutions like that that's serving about three, around 300,000 market traders. They also have an account called Diamond Yellow together with MTN which has about 6.3 million accounts at the moment but only 20% of them are women. So our role is really helping them increase that percentage of uptake and usage by women. So this is the type of products that we develop taking into account not only the product features which are critical, but also the consumer and financial education piece, and of course, designing business models that are profitable and scalable. Thank you, and I think we'll go to the audience actually. Um, a very distinguished audience as well as a uh, panel. Uh, let me go over here, some, some questions over here. Fittingly, my first question is for a woman. Thank you. My name is Agnes Soufé. I'm acting executive secretary of an NGO based in Ivory Coast. And uh, I'm also working for a financial institution in UK. So I have a question because I've been facing a situation last year where I had to start helping a group of 4,000 women that were very, very poor in the region of Dabu Ivory Coast. And the point was that they come to me because they needed jobs, actually, and they could not find neither finance nor jobs. So within five minutes, we, we created altogether 2,000 jobs only by setting a unit, a smoking fish unit in 200 villages made uh, with five women working. So that goes uh, to 1,000 women working and uh, the main point we have after that was that when we wanted to implement the project, the women were, most of them, illiterate. So this uh, leads me to my question. As an illiterate poor woman living in a country place, how do, we have, or do I have access to the finance of Afawa when I have no education, no information, no mobile technology about a bank account available. Thank you. That's a great question. Let's get some more. Thank you. Okay, mine is more like a contribution. I am Pastor Ige. Okay, I'm a fish farmer in Nigeria, PI Farms. Okay, and we grow fish in Nigeria. I'm here with my wife to attend this program. And I think uh, Afawa is a good uh, program, okay? Uh, uh, something that has come out is uh, how do you change the mindset of people? Because even if you put a policy in place that can make funds available for people and their mindset is, I can't go for it, then what happens? They don't go for it. So while well, the contributions I, I have as well, I think it's important to involve uh, persons that influence culture and mindset. Um, I'm a pastor, so I know what we do. We speak to the minds of people. So you must, it's good if you walk with people who address the minds of people so that they can educate the community to see the value of equality. It, it's not about one person more being more important than another, but equality. For example, in my business, uh, we, we have equal shares. It's, it, it's our business and it's equal shares. So it's equality. All right, women need to see their value. And then uh, the, the idea of the level playing ground is very important. It's not that well, you give one advantage to another. And then I also think it's good to make the best of whatever, whatever is available in any community. All right. I said I had a contribution, not a question. <laughs> Okay, if I, well, I, I guess, um, what, how would you walk along with people who influence the, the people who affect the culture of people? You, you, some, in some places it's emirs, in some places it's their pastors, in some places it's their community leaders. How do you reach them so that by the time they speak to their community and let the women see what is really available, that you're not inferior. You may be different, but you're not inferior. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, contribution right here. 
A question, indeed, not a contribution. My name is Maureen Chibo. I write for Real News Magazine. It's an online publication. Um, my question is on sustainability of AFAWA and all the other programs that are meant to help women. How can this program be sustained? If you take into consideration the fact that since Beijing, there has been programs targeting women uh, entrepreneurs to help them to get finance. But when governments change, when um, presidents like uh, ADB president leaves, another one comes, how do you sustain these programs so that it can really achieve its target? I'm also directing this question to our uh, former finance minister, um, um, Dr. Konjiwala. Uh, you've, you have you win, and you, it has produced the, the likes of uh, Hawa Belo. Is this program sustainable in Nigeria? Because we have changed government and a whole lot of things have changed. So how do we address this issue of sustainability of programs? Thank you. Thanks very much for your concise questions. I think we had a, a question at the front. And w what I'll do is I'll get a few more questions. And then, uh, as we're very short on time, the, the panelists will answer the questions and use it as their wrapping up uh, speech. My name is uh, Dorothy Jeff Namani. I'm the CEO of Novo Health Africa. Uh, we're also in Nigeria. Um, before I ask my question, I just want to tell Antin Gozi that I have a friend who benefited from you win. And she actually lived in America. It was a transparent process, I must say. She, did, she um, applied from there, and she did get $10,000, which enabled her to move back to Nigeria and start a, uh, a, a nursery school. Um, so I know that um, these programs do work. Um, my question is, we, after hearing what everybody has said, and I think uh, one thing is that we need other enablers, not just making the finance available. In 2011, Novo Health Africa was approached by United Nations Women, and we partnered with them because they were making finances available to women. But at a point, they found out that uh, some of the women, when there were uh, ill health issues, those women would use the money to look after their family. And uh, so that was a very important uh, thing they brought to the table, and they, they approached also that will help uh, them design a health insurance product that can take care of the women. So, um, Geraldine, um, I don't know if you're considering other enablers along the way, and if you're, you're doing that, at what level are they going to be considered? Thank you. Thanks very much. Final question here. My name is Mariani Nguni. I'm from the Association of Zambian Women in Mining. Um, as women miners, we have had a lot of challenges in accessing finance for mechanizing our operations. We have had um, uh, problems um, even fulfilling uh, the orders that we get when we attend international uh, trade fairs. We had um, a woman uh, heading the um, uh, African Development Bank in Zambia, Mrs. Vivian Apopo. She came up with a brilliant idea where a lot of us assembled together over a period of uh, maybe about six months, we put up a credible um, project proposal with her assistance, of course, and her members of staff. Uh, at the end of the day, she asked us, can you suggest some banks that you would feel comfortable to work with? We did. At, and um, the issue was became a nightmare at the end of the day because we were being referred from one a financial institution to another and we have been exposed. Not all micro credit uh, financing companies charge exorbitant um, interest rates. 
but three quarters of them were charging up to 300%, which may, literally made us slaves of these uh, microfinancing companies. And um, we, Bank of Zambia, of course, came to our rescue. They put a cap, it was 42%, but not all of the microfinancing com companies were adhering to that. And some of our members have had challenges because when they open an account with a commercial bank, they are asked, can you save, can you bank with us for six months? And in those six months, where does the poor woman who is using picks and shovels in a raw setup raise that kind of money for her to be able to borrow money? Because where we are operating from, those we are operating from traditional land, where even getting title over the land that we are operating from is a very big challenge. Traditional chiefs are not ready to give up their land, you know, uh, without a struggle. Or they will give you land maybe about 10 to 15 kilometers away from where you are actually conducting your mining activity. So as the um, African Development Bank, what are you going to do through AFAWA to assist the women in, in the mining sector? Because we want to start cottage industries in the rural uh, setup where women in the villages will be able to help us add value to our products so that we can earn, um, our proceeds can improve. At the end of the day, if we mechanize our operations, we'll be able to uh, sell more than what we are doing uh, uh, currently. And um, Bank of Zambia, I'm glad to mention here that about uh, 15 to 20 years ago, they had a, um, a, um, a product which went very well for the women, and this was the credit guarantee scheme. A lot of women benefited from the credit guarantee scheme. Along the way, and because of change of governments, this uh, credit guarantee scheme na died a natural death. I would like to appeal to uh, ADB in conjunction with Bank of Zambia, can you reintroduce the credit guarantee scheme? What we, are not, what we are asking for is not charity. We want to borrow to pay back. We want to borrow also at the end of the day to improve our businesses and be credible taxpayers in our own country because we are the mothers. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very pertinent contribution. We, we sadly... Uh, perhaps we can... Um, perhaps afterwards we can all uh, talk with the panellists. But right now I'd, I'd like them just to uh, wrap up, answer questions uh, in guise of a, a conclusion. Maybe we could start with you, Marisa, and uh, move across. Gladly. And I'll wrap up in the form of advice to Geraldine and Afawa on what I think we've heard through the questions. The first is that Afawa can't do it alone. You're just one part of the answer. And so to stress the importance of coordination and partnerships with governments um, on the need for education, which was so evident in the first question, with civil society, with the business community, with the international donor community. So please don't think you have to do it alone. And then the second advice, and this goes to the issue of how do we make AFAWA sustainable? Um, I sound a bit like a broken record, but the importance of incorporating sex disaggregated data in everything that AFAWA does, and ultimately I would hope that you would infect in a very positive way the rest of the African Development Bank so that this just becomes business as usual. Thank you. Thanks very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, some really good contributions. Um, I'll also, in answering questions, try to put some things to our power. Um, first of all, we've heard from Jennifer, from 
people in the audience that there are different types of women with different needs. Now, Afawa has to be very clear. It cannot be everything to everybody. So the first question, in order not to dash expectations, because now we leave this room with the idea there's a $3 billion opportunity coming. And uh, everybody from women in the village to micro to meza to everyone will be waiting. So Afawa must give a very clear de definition of what is your target population among the women. And we, should be, we shouldn't mind if even they say we are targeting SMEs, if they can move SMEs along the spectrum to become value, larger value-added businesses that employ more people, why not? If they decide to do micro, let's move the women from micro up the value chain and not leave them where they are. So that's the first piece of advice, and it will answer the question of these different segments. Let's differentiate. The second one is on the, the facility is from the non-concessional window of ADB. Non-concessional, meaning it's going to be at the more commercial rates. By the time it gets to the intermediaries, they will also have to add on their own rates and so on. So let us also be very realistic in defining what these rates are, working with the central banks, so that even if you target SMEs, they'll be able to access and it will be somewhat affordable. We don't have an escalation that drives them out completely out of the market. But more than the rates are all the impediments on the way, including some people have said that women have an emotional distance. I don't know who said it, but yes. Oh, from our Women's World Banking. It's very important communication. And that's where my pastor brother there said that you should work with the influencers. So how are we going to work with those who work with women, who can access women? Not so much to, I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree that many women are devoid of confidence or don't believe in themselves. I, I don't want to generalize, but I'm amazed by the women I meet, even in my own village. They are full of confidence. When they see me, you know what they tell me? They say, my wife, in my husband's village, you're not doing anything for us. You know, we, we know what we want to do, but you're not providing the environment. So they are confident people, but we have not been able to serve them the way they want. But whatever it is, I think the advice is communications, communications to those women to let them know what is available to them. Sustainability, the, uh, last, maybe the last point, or, or, but one. I think the issue of sustainability of programs uh, uh, and, 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 uh, is vital. For the ADB, I think it's easy. It's a multilateral institution. So whether presidents come and go is, you know, I think they can continue. For our countries, it's a different issue because sometimes you have discontinuities. But this is why we have voting public. If you find that a program is good, organize yourselves and make it known to those voted into power that this program is yielding something. Make it known to the central bank, the minister of finance, the president, the, your target audience, that this needs to continue. So that in, in Africa, we will not, it's not just one country, it's not just Nigeria. In many, many countries, we have discontinuities. How do we solve this? We have to have the voice of the women saying this matters for us. And then lastly, I really, really like this issue of enabling other enablers or, or other programs that help women do what they do. I think it's crucial. Health insurance, you know, ch uh, um, children's health. There are so many things women worry about that also distract them. Well, this kind of program cannot solve all of it. But what I notice is that when you start to empower women, you can start bringing other programs. We have micro insurance. Once the women get settled and start being a big, bit successful, they start asking. That's what I've noticed for some of these uh, products and services. And what we need to do is to make sure they're available and can be made available to them. So Afawa, very great initiative. We are all excited. But I think there's still a job of work to do in defining th things clearly so we don't disappoint and instead we actually add to the excitement of women on the continent. Thank you. It's been a very exciting morning. Thank you.
Jennifer, please. I will not repeat what my sisters just said because that's, I was going to say most of those. But let, let, me, let me say, uh, leave you with a thought that everyone in this room is expected to contribute to this. It's not only a power. I'm challenging you to do it. On 2nd May, as I received the, the Peace for Business Award in Oslo, we were made to stand up and raise our first hands in commitment to zero poverty and equity and a fair society. And I'm going to read the commitment that we made to the world, which I think each one of you, as a colleague, should make before we leave here. And this is what it is said. The United Nations Sustainable Development Goals provide a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to end poverty, combat climate change, and fight injustice and end inequality. By applying innovation, resources, and expertise, I will pursue the business opportunities inherent in building a greener, more equitable, and inclusive society. I am a business leader who knows that businesses cannot succeed in societies that fail. I will do my utmost to be business worthy in all efforts and to tune my business to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And now, I call on all my peers, who are you, to do the same. Thank you. Your final thoughts, Tadas? Well, a great deal has been said. I'll just say three quick points. I think the sustainability issue will be catered for by taking a business approach. I think that is already a, a key principle in, in the design of the program. I think as much as we talk about business approaches, we need to remember that leveling the playing field and dealing with mindsets cannot be dealt with by business as usual. One does need strategic interventions, special measures, because it requires reforms beyond the world of finance. That, I think, is something that's very welcome in the approach of ours taking. It obviously means dealing with a whole range of stakeholders beyond the financial community. The third and last point, I think, is what people have said, partnerships, innovation, and incentives to get the execution moving and for it to be effective. Great. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Your questions were fantastic. Uh, it's amazing that there's a full house right at the very end. Shows how important this is. A big round of applause for all our participants and uh, for Geraldine and the best of luck uh, in uh, pushing this forward. Thank you. Thank you.